But I, I wrote down there's a war for your altar. So you look for somebody next to you and say there's a war for your altar. You believe that? For your altar. There's a war going on for your altar. And Jesus is going to win the war if you let him. you got to come in behind his cover. You're going in behind him and under him, under the shadow of the Almighty. You're hanging so close to him that you're right in his shadow because you're under the protection of his wings. And if any of this behavior that looks like it could be sketchy, error on the side of being careful. Because a lot of people have started that first step on the slippery slope. I don't have a problem in that area. I can do this. And then all of a sudden, yeah, maybe you do have a problem in that area because your guard is down. And the other thing is your altar is where you worship. <laughs> and I used to worship the Grateful Dead. <laughs> I didn't think of what an ironic thing that that is. Grateful Dead. Now I'm gratefully alive. <laughs> right? I mean, I was telling some people yesterday, uh, one of the guys that I went to a concert with, took so much LSD that he went into an institution. As far as I know, never came out. Uh, and, you know, like I, I was standing right next to him, and I could have, you know, there's so many ways that God saved me in the midst of horrifically bad decisions I was making in that whole drug scene world. But I didn't know I was worshiping them, but I drove all over the country. My friends and I took time off of work. We went to Red Rocks in Colorado, and, like, that was a big event. We were going to go see the dead in Red Rocks, Colorado. Like, I have better priorities now than I did then, okay? We were called deadheads. Shouldn't that have been a warning? <laughs> yeah, but you walk right past them. And everybody else knows there's a problem but you because you're in it and you're caught up in it, right? And he brought life into a dead situation in my life and he hasn't stopped doing that ever since. It's, it's wonderful, but I had to recognize that was an altar in my life that had to go. And I had a whole big set of albums that I had collected over time, and I took them to the garbage truck. I called the office because my family's in the garbage business. I said, well, I, I got to find the nearest truck. <laughs> and he told me, well, this guy's over on South Street. Bless you. And uh, I drove my truck over to South Street, and I dumped all the albums in the back of the truck, and I ran the thing. You know how that blade comes down? And Because I wasn't giving them to anyone else. That, that was a weapon of mass destruction in the enemy's hands. And I'm saying, no, this deserves to be destroyed. Just like when they brought the books out, right, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and they burned them, those that had, had been practicing witchcraft, they said, there's no good use for this book. We're going to burn it up. And it's funny that a lot, not funny, it's awesome that a lot of the rock and roll people of that era got saved. Uh, the guy that sang for Led Zeppelin, Robert Plant, Led Zeppelin was involved in the worst witchcraft, and he saved today. How cool is that? He got on the right stairway to heaven. <laughs> All right, so uh, he just, like, the Lord really hit me this week, and I'm going to just try to convey how he did it, and hopefully it helps you too. But it's really not an easy thing to grasp the fact that God would take that guy that I was that was making really bad decisions and say, not only am I going to save you from that mess so you can spend eternity with me, I'm putting eternity in you right now. You are now the temple. It's not a building anymore. You are the temple, and I'm going to live inside of you, so you better pay attention to me while I'm in there. 24-7, <laughs> I never slumber or sleep, the Lord would say, right? I'm always on duty in you to protect you and to enlighten you, and to reveal secrets to you. But if you ignore me, and you never pray, and you never talk to me, and you never ask, then I'm not going to force myself. I'll let you learn the hard way if you have to, and I sure did in the beginning. So when we read the Bible, we can forget that we've been raised in a Christian country for the most part. It seems to be less so now than when I was younger, but it's right on our dollar bill in God we trust, right? There are still a lot of Christian roots in America, and there's certainly a big remnant across America of people that still love God and are serving him and are praying for our nation. They know the verse that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, purpose to seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. We need to pray that on a regular basis, don't we? 
So first it starts for our temple, and then we realize, oh no, we're an amazing country that has blessed the world with the missionaries that have gone out from here and the people like Billy Graham, just as one example, that we created a culture that allowed the whole world to be touched by Christianity. It's incredible. But if I'm a first century Jew in Jerusalem, it's a very different world than the one that we live in today. And I'd say for the people in this room, the biggest difference would be how the women are treated. Okay? Even among the Jewish people, the women still do not have standing. They weren't considered equal to the men. We take that one for granted now today. And, and I would agree that there are still times that women aren't always treated equally. But compared to then, massive difference, okay? Jesus is the first one that really honored women as equal partners in, in everything that we do. When, when they wrote the Declaration of Independence and in our, in our founding documents, when they said all men, it should have said all men and women <laughs> are created equal, right? You believe me on this? You think I'm getting a little weird? No, the Bible still says that the, the man is the head of the household and that the woman submits to the man, but it also says the man has to love the wife the way Christ loved the church. Which one's harder? <laughs> I think the man's got a harder job. Because it's easy for a woman to love and respect a man if he's loving her the way Jesus loved the church, isn't it? Selah. But I had an option if I was there because I could have gone to these temples. I could have gone to these false idols. And if the Jews weren't going to accept me and I was seeking, I might go to the wrong place. And a lot of the people, like in the Corinthians, when you see Paul writing these letters, he's writing to former pagans. And, and it's not like writing to former Jews who are now Christians. They're not really former Jews. They're just completed Jews that now realize that Jesus is the Messiah. But if you were a pagan, you didn't have all that root system of knowing the Bible. So it was a different kind of angle. And that's why throughout the New Testament you find all these riots whenever Paul comes into a new area and he says that Gentiles are getting filled with the Spirit just like we are. And people were like, no way. Because after women, Gentiles were not given equal status either. So to think that God would include Gentiles, deadheads, bikers, hell's angels, like, oh no, that can't be right. Guess what? It's right. Not only that, Jesus said, they're getting in the kingdom ahead of you, Pharisees. Turn the whole thing upside down. Because now it's about the heart, not about the status, not about the education. You could have all the status and education, and your heart could still be far away from God. You could be that prostitute that just was spared from dying on the street, and you could be the first one to see Jesus coming out of the tomb. Mary, Magdalene prostitute. They cast seven demons at her. She's the first one that sees the resurrected Jesus. That tells you. Flip the whole thing on its head. All the ladies should be getting excited right now. <laughs> Never mind my relatives, the Romans, that were in charge. They were brutal dictators, okay? Brutal. We have what's called the Miranda rights. You know what that is? If, uh, if, if you're arrested, you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. And you have the right to re remain silent. The Romans didn't have that rule. <laughs> right now in China, they don't have that rule. There's plenty of places around the world that still don't do that. So we take things for granted and we forget that we live in a great country where you're presumed innocent until proven guilty. That's awesome. Man, women, doesn't matter who you are if they're following the law. Now there's places in the country that's been violated, but if they're doing what the law says, you're presumed innocent until proven guilty, no matter how bad it looks. Isn't that amazing? It's all from a Christian root. It all started because that's where our foundations are. But the Romans, you only had to step out of line a little bit, and they crucified you. There was one emperor that had 10,000 people crucified at the same time. It stretched hundreds of miles. Like every so often, you'd see another slave, a rebellious slave, crucified. To warn you, if you're coming into our city, this is what happens to people that don't follow the rules. Jesus is saying, nobody is too far away from me, no matter how bad you've been. If you repent, I still accept you into my kingdom. Flip the whole thing upside down. <laughs> I wrote down, he brought the super into the natural. <laughs> 
for me and you. He turned us from this natural, faulty person, and he put supernatural inside our faulty, natural bodies. You should be really grateful for that. But we should also get convicted if we get sloppy about it. And we're not taking care of our altar. And I'm talking about me first. It's like, wait a minute. I get one chance in this life. It's my turn right now, right? We could all say that. This is my turn. And not about what are they going to write on my gravestone. I don't want to know that. I want to know what am I going to do today? How am I going to live to try to please the king today? What, how can I look back on yesterday and say, say, I'm not comparing myself to you. I'm comparing myself to me yesterday. And I want to be closer to God than I was yesterday every day. And there's no limit. So keep doing that every day. He said to me, as it is in heaven, I want it to be in you. You are the temple. And as it is in heaven, people used to go to the temple because that's where they believed God met mankind. Now we meet him right in our own heart. All right. So I'm going to just go a little bit faster because I want you to look at the handout that I gave you. And uh, it says unveiling the new temple at the top because I just really like the analogy that this commentary uses. And I want you to consider it. And it's just worth chewing on a little bit. So I just gave you a copy so you could take it home with you and um, kind of focus on what I'm saying now and then meditate on it when, when you go home. And if anybody ever wants any of our slides or any of the stuff that we show up here, you can uh, just tell us and we'll email it to you. It's no problem. This picture was just one of many on the internet that shows a face of Jesus made up of other faces. Can you see that from where you are? And it's also on that form that I gave you. It probably would have been better in color, but you could still make it out. And that's a message in and of itself, okay? That the body of Christ is made up of all individuals, but when you look at us all collectively together, we are his body. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Is anybody excluded? Nobody. Not by the color of your skin, not by your IQ, not by your level of education. You didn't have to fill out an application to get into the kingdom. We'll get back to you. My people will call your people, and we'll let you know if you're in. No. And I wasn't even let in on suspension. <laughs> we'll watch you for 90 days, and then we'll let you know. <laughs> Probation. He let me in. I'm thinking, this can't be right. I made too many mistakes. But that's the picture of the body. And then this verse that we read is God is transforming each one of us into the holy of holies. That's where the altar was. That's where the fire was. The mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. That's what he's transforming us into. And if we, if we really think about this, our whole prayer life will change. That it's right inside me, the power of God, heaven, is on earth in me, at my altar. And then it says, we are his dwelling place, right? That's what we started with. Uh, I am the dwelling place of the presence of God. And that's a good thing to just keep repeating to yourself. And it came out of this verse. He's transforming me into the holy of holies and his dwelling place inside of me through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in me. So let's just look at uh, what it says on this handout that I gave you, unveiling the new temple. And, and the man starts by comparing this to Paul's language in Ephesians, and he's going to use the word refugee. And it says a refugee wants to be accepted in the new community to rebuild a semblance of the life that was stolen by war. Okay, you all with me? You know, this is happening in Syria for the last several years. People have been leaving with the clothes on their back, and getting on boats, um, and you know, people out of Africa are getting on boats and trying to make it somewhere into Europe, and they're dying on the sea, and they're being turned back. And if, if you've left a country like Syria that's in a civil war, you're not bringing a whole lot with you, are you? And the main thing you want, he's saying, is really important to grasp this, is that I can land somewhere where they'll accept me, and I can rebuild my life. Now let me take you out of a Grateful Dead concert and me coming out of that mess and that drug scene and all of the decadence and the sin, and that was like a war that was trying to take my life. So I was a refugee coming out of that war and coming into a little church in Nutley, New Jersey, which is where you know, I, I was loved by a bunch of Christians there that loved me, where my mom happened to be going at the time. And, and I just couldn't believe it at first. These people were being really nice to me. And I, I didn't look like somebody you should be nice to. I, I remember in college, 
This is back in the day when, when your lock was one of those locks that you could see on the door, like it would pop up and pop down. If you ever locked your keys, you got a hanger and you could pop it up because the thing was big, right? That little lock thing. I mean, I was walking down the street in college and I could see the locks going down on the door, on the car doors in front of me, like the mothers grabbing their girls and saying, don't look. Well, like, well, why? Because you look dangerous. Because you're crazy. You're high on drugs. I was in a different kind of war than what's going on in Syria, but the devil was still trying to take me out. And I was a refugee coming out of that world. It's all I knew. It's all I ever even thought could have been the right way to go. It's what everybody always validated me about, that whole scene. And I needed somebody to accept me even though I was a mess. And they did. And I walked out of a service one night and I heard the song, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the only thing, there's just too little love. And these people weren't big scholars or, you know, they were just regular Christians. But they didn't judge me. They just looked at me and, and welcomed me and, and I just felt the love. I wasn't a Christian yet, but I felt the love because I knew I had to change. It's amazing. So that's how you want to keep this in mind. It's not just the Syrian refugees or people coming across the Mediterranean from Libya because there's a civil war in that country. It's like these are desperate people. They're willing to die in order to get out of the situation that they're in. Deuteronomy says in 1019, so you too must show love to foreigners for you yourselves were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. <laughs> so here it gets real personal now, right? This is like, if you forget that you were once a mess too and you start acting like up on your high horse that you're not gonna help somebody who needs help, this is a problem. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. There's no problem that any person has that God's not big enough to help them. You don't have to be the one to help every single person in the world, but you do have to take on your assignment of the people that are in your sphere. Well, actually, you don't have to, but things don't turn out well if you turn your back on the poor because you forgot that you were once poor. Maybe not the way I was, but if you didn't know the Lord, you were set for eternal damnation. You believe that, right? And now because you know him, you made that decision. Today, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise <laughs> to the thief on the cross. He didn't have a whole lot of time left, did he? Well, I need to go get baptized. Well, no, I'm sorry. They're not taking you down off the cross to go get baptized. You call me Lord, you'll be with me today in paradise. Isn't that awesome? This expands it a little bit in Zechariah 7. It says, this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Judge fairly and show mercy and kindness to one another. Don't oppress, come on, widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. What's up, guys? Come on. You can read, right? You have this? Let's say it together. Do not oppress widows, orphans, foreigners, and the poor. True religion, it says in the New Testament, that's from Zechariah 7, true religion is what? Minister to the orphans and the widows, right? It's right there. Don't oppress them and don't scheme against each other. Verse 11, your ancestors refused to listen to what? That message that you can't turn your back on people who need help. And what happened? They stubbornly turned away and put their fingers in their ears to keep from hearing. Who? not my job. I don't have to go help them. Oh, really? And what if somebody said that when you were in that mess? No, no. Pay it forward, brother. Pay it forward. You got help, you help somebody else. Somebody pays for your coffee in the, in the drive-up line, you pay for the guy behind you. Right? Six hours that happened one time at a Starbucks. Every person for six hours paid for the person behind them when they knew the person in front of them. That's so cool, isn't it? That's such a Christian thing. Verse 12, they made their hearts as hard as stone so they could not hear the instructions or the messages that the Lord of the heaven's armies had sent them by his spirit through the earlier prophets. Oh boy, 13 is an eye opener, isn't it? Since they refused to listen when I called to them, I would not listen when they called to me, says the Lord of heaven's armies. As with a whirlwind, I scattered them among the distant nations where they lived as strangers. So wait a minute. You were a stranger. God took you in, but then you turned your back on people that needed help 
and you became a stranger again. That's what that says. They refused to listen to me. I didn't listen to them. Like a whirlwind, I scattered them, and they became strangers. Now, I'm not trying to bring you down here. I'm sorry. Not a lot of you are smiling right now. It's going to get better because you're not turning your back on the poor. But this is what goes on on the altar. People are like, what should I pray for? Oh, man, that's easy. God, what's wrong with me? <laughs> Start there. He'll always answer that one. <laughs> right? That's a good one. How can I be more like you today before I leave? How much time do you have? God could say back. It's not just surface prayers. Oh, I need this. I need that. It's like, no, Lord, I need you. I need to lose my old nature, and I need to take on your nature 24-7, right? Like every second, I need your nature in me. I don't want to do this. I don't want to put my fingers in my ears when you're trying to talk to me because you're, I'm not listening to you, and then when I do cry out to you, you don't want to hear me because that's not how the formula works. It's like I'm grateful every day that I'm still alive, right? I mean, you want to live that way. We don't always think that way. Uh, but... There's some serious implications here if you turn your back on that refugee. But that could just be an unsaved person. Could be that refugee that doesn't know God. And, and God's saying, no, you're going to uh, you're gonna have to step out of your comfort zone a little bit here. And you're going to have to talk to them about me. Because what if nobody did that to you? Somebody else was inconvenienced and didn't do what they thought they were going to do that day because they stopped and talked to you. I'm sure glad about that. So then the next little line says, the ultimate sign of acceptance for an asylum seeker is to receive citizenship in the country that they have adopted as their own. Anybody here got a green card or became a citizen in America after not having been here? Got a couple over here from Brazil. I mean, how valuable is that thing to you, that you have now a passport in the new country? Come on. Awesome. Well, we have a passport that stamped the kingdom of God. We were foreigners and strangers, but now we came in and now we are fellow citizens of a different kingdom. But you were an asylum seeker before you got in. So that's all he's saying. Don't forget that. In Deuteronomy 18, you could look at that. We mostly know the verse 18. A lot of us do anyway. Thou shalt remember the Lord your God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth in order that he may establish his covenant. Before that, there's other warnings, though, that says, hey, don't forget, you're going into a land and the houses are already built and the crops have already been planted. You're not going to have to do any of the work you normally would. Don't forget that I'm giving that to you and that you're blessed because of that and forget and turn your back on a stranger. Uh, what about Ruth? She was one of those. And you remember Boaz let her pick on the sides of the field. She could go out and get, don't forget the stranger. Show God's love. And that's what he says, if you read the rest of that line, in between the two boxes on there, it says that's the position, Paul declares, in which Gentile Christians now find themselves in Ephesians, that we were those asylum seekers, and now we are in the kingdom of God. And then in Ephesians 2, it says, so the Messiah came and gave the good news. Peace has come. Now, if you haven't been in a war, you might not appreciate how valuable peace is. But if you were thinking of committing suicide, you were in a war. The devil was trying to take you out. Now, all of a sudden, peace has come. War has stopped. If, you're left, if you left Syria in the middle of a civil war and landed in a place in Europe, the war has stopped. You're in a safe place. You're like, oh, my God. I never thought I'd get out of that place. But here I am. So how could I turn my back on somebody else that's coming out of that? Pay it forward. No. If he did it for you, you help them. And he wants us to live in this place of gratitude, right? Start that way on your altar. And then it says, peace, that is, for those of you who were a long way away, and peace, too, for those who were close at hand. Through him, capital H, Jesus, Ephesians 2.18, through him, you see, we both have access to the Father in one spirit. He means Jews and Gentiles. This is the result. You are no longer foreigners or strangers. No, you are fellow citizens with God's holy people. You are members of God's household. How many are glad about that? Good. Once they were foreigners and strangers in relation to Israel, the family of the one true God, but now they are full members. Not because they've accepted the Jewish law or circumcision, but simply because what Jesus himself had accomplished. 
What Jesus has done is to make and declare peace. Peace is one of the best loved words in the world, especially if you're a refugee or an asylum seeker. It's a wonderful thing to discover that peace has been declared. Remember that famous picture of World War II where the guy's bending over? <laughs> the celebration that happened when America knew the World War II was over. Hitler had been defeated. And then the next paragraph says, Gentiles and Jews alike are now to be at home in the same family. This must have sounded as extraordinary and revolutionary to traditional Jews. And the guy who wrote it, Paul himself, had of course been a traditional Jew. As it was wonderful and exhilarating for the Gentiles who had looked at Judaism from the outside and felt drawn to the God of whom the Jewish scriptures had spoken. You with me? Then he says this powerful thing. The closing verses of chapter 2 in Ephesians take one of the central symbols of Judaism and turn it, on, turn it inside out. Verse 20 in Ephesians 2. You are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with King Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is fitted together and grows into a holy temple of the Lord. You too are being built up together in him into a place where God will live by the Spirit. So if you look around you, you're sitting next to another brick. <laughs> Just tell the person, you're a good looking brick. God's going to use you in his building. <laughs> so look, we are the living stones that he's using to build this new temple. He's the cornerstone. How valuable is that? But we are all here for a reason, and that's why we have to respect each other as well. Even if we don't get along, we don't agree on every little point of doctrine or every piece of our decisions that we make. No, but we're fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family as other Christians. Ah, oh, you're not too excited about this. All right, that's good. Thank you. I'll thank this side over here. Flip it over to the other side. <laughs> I mean, I'm just stunned by the beauty of that picture of the face of Jesus. Can you put that back up? Just put the picture of the face up there because I really like that. The one, the color picture. Yeah, let's just leave that up there while we do this part. It says the temple in Jerusalem was not only the religious heart of the nation and the place of pilgrimage for Jews throughout the world, it was also political, social, musical, cultural heart of Jerusalem, as well as the place of celebration and feasting. The reason for all this was that Israel's God, Yahweh, had promised to live there. Where did he live? In the temple, right? That's why they went there. And within the temple, there were three chambers, and he lived in the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could go back there. And he didn't always come out if his altar wasn't in good shape. That's why they tied a rope to his leg. If he fell down dead in there, they could pull him out without going behind the curtain. The same curtain when Jesus said, it is finished, that ripped from the top to the bottom. <laughs> it's a violent word. It says that the heavens were rendered, rend open, and from top to bottom, that thing was open and Bill Johnson likes to say not to let people in but to let God out <laughs> in you oh what a blessing we have that in us oh, it was believed by many there that that was the place where heaven met earth look at the person next to you you are the place where heaven meets earth oh that's good news He's living on the inside of me. It's not in the temple anymore. You're the temple. He's living inside of you. That's where heaven and earth meet. As it is in heaven, let it be here on earth. In me. It's revolutionary. And they didn't like it. A lot of the Jews were like, no way. Can't. We're not letting those hell's angels in. Now, Paul is declaring that the living God is constructing a new temple. It consists not of stones and arches and pillars and altars, but of human beings. Until Paul, nobody had said anything quite like this. One might almost say that God himself has, in a sense, become a stranger and asylum seeker within his own world. Just meditate on that one for a minute. What does that mean? He loves you so much. He's coming after you. 
but you still have to let him in. He's looking for a home in you. He's the asylum seeker looking for a new place inside of you. How many want to let him in? Come on, let's just lift our hand. I'll let you in, Lord. I'm not going to keep you out. I don't want to refine you to one little tiny corner over here. I want you ruling throughout my whole temple in every part, in every room of the house. I'm not going to keep you locked up in the corner upstairs and only go up and see you once in a while. You have full reign in mine. I don't want you being an asylum seeker in my temple. I want you here all the time. That was such a powerful analogy for me. Think of Paul on the road to Damascus. Who's chasing who? God was the asylum seeker saying, Paul, it's hard for you to persecute me, isn't it? And he's like, well, who are you? I'm Jesus. Huh. And all of a sudden, he calls him Lord. Saw the light. God found a home in Paul's heart, and it changed the world because he opened up the doors to his heart and said yes. Takes a whole new picture of that knocking on the door, doesn't it? That one that we all know. With the lantern outside, there's no handle on the outside door, and God's knocking. I'm looking to make a home in your heart. Will you let me in? Say yes. Good job. <laughs> the living God was now seeking to make his home in the hearts and lives, and particularly the communities. That's called ecclesia. That's what we are. We're an ecclesia. We're the called out ones. We are family together as Christians. Doesn't mean you abandon your earthly family, but we are now a new kind of family, the ecclesia, the called out ones to govern, to rule, to help people come into the kingdom. Mm. All right, I'm going to keep going. The next uh, paragraph says, this meant that the new temple had to be constructed of two sorts of material that would fuse together into a single building. The foundation of the building consisted of the apostles and prophets. Jesus himself was the stone reserved for the place of highest honor, the one which held the rest of the building together. So you get it now? You have Jesus is the cornerstone, the apostles and the prophets are the foundation, and we are the bricks. We're going to be made into these living stones that are going to build the, the, the temple of the community of believers. We really have to value each other. We can't pull rank on each other. The greatest title in the kingdom is servant. That's how we gain greatness. What's stopping me from great is good. Everything's fine. Well, maybe I can serve in a new capacity in a different way. Spirit-led, not performance-led, spirit-led. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant, right? And then I love this next one. There's just two more paragraphs to go. The building itself has its peculiar glory in the, the way in which bricks from two different quarries are to be built into it side by side. Jews and Gentiles, two different quarries. <laughs> Joined together in a new kind of architectural beauty. Jewish believers and Gentile believers, in other words, are not simply fellow members of the Christian community. Together and only together. That means one new man. No more wall of separation any longer. We're all part of the same family. Together, we form a community in which the living God will be delighted to take up residence. All right, it's 1208. I'm going to go to one more portion of scripture. You good? Once he starts playing, you know we're starting to wind down to the end here. Can you play Waymaker? I really like that one. <laughs> They're like, I'm finding a way to my bagel. <laughs> Carbs cause you to crave. Just putting that out there. <laughs> so um, let's just go to that verse. Um, it's going to be right near the end, okay? Luke chapter 10. Can you um, expand your thinking a little bit on Martha and Mary? Just say yes, it'll help you. Good. Because, you know, we all know this story, I'm guessing, right? Everybody here knows the story of Martha and Mary. It's used often to criticize people who are too performance-oriented and, and too busy and nervous. And clearly, that's the language here. I just want you to try to expand yourself a little bit and put yourself back in, into that culture. It's hard to do because our culture is so different. Our culture is so much freer than the culture that they have. But if you were a woman, you weren't considered of equal status. Forget about voting. You were a piece of property many times. It's not well known, but the Jewish, uh, the, 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 the people that followed the laws were divorcing their wives at a whim. The men could divorce their wives on a whim over any 
of the slightest problems. And Jesus addressed that. He said, no, no, only through sexual uh, misconduct. That's the only way. But you can't break this covenant. We don't get the full range of how important that is to him. So especially that we're talking about Mary here with Martha and Mary, we know that he was in their house and Jesus loved them and he loved the brother that had died. That's going to be later, but here he's just in their house. And again, I'm going to guess that most of you know it, but we'll start in verse 38. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their journey, they came to a village where a woman welcomed Jesus into her home. Her name was Martha and she had a sister named Mary. Mary sat down attentively before the master, absorbing every revelation he shared. All right, just meditate on that for a minute, okay? That's your altar. That's you in the morning before you leave the house. That's saying, I'm going to start my day right here, attentively listening to what you want to tell me. You've got a game plan for today, different than any other day, because today's different than any other day, right? Are we doing this? Are we attentively? That's a beautiful word, isn't it? She had sat down attentively before the master, absorbing every revelation he shared. Maybe this is a big deal to me because for a long time in my Christian life, I didn't do this. I waited till the end of the day. Maybe I'll get to it. That's silly. If you're ever going to ask for guidance, do it before you step out of the house. That's when you need the GPS. Okay? Better to do it at night than not do it at all. But boy, morning, good time. Martha became exasperated. How many can relate? Yeah, I saw a lot of hands are going up. By finishing the numerous household chores in preparation for her guests. So she interrupted Jesus and said, Lord, don't you think it's unfair that my sister left me to do all the work by myself? You should tell her to get up and help me. How many can relate? It's, yeah, I'm not, it's not a trick question. Just people being honest. Here's the deal, though. God was in the living room. You believe that? God in the flesh was in the living room. Can the meal wait? Yes! Okay? So this is what happens in life. We're so routine. We, we just get into, the, fall into these ruts and these habits. And one definition of a rut is an open grave on one end. Right? Oh. So look, be careful about the ruts. Be led by the Spirit. Be alert to what He's saying to you. He, he told Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son, right? But while the knife was in the air, he gave him another order. So what if he wasn't listening and he just went ahead and killed him? That wouldn't have been God's will, would it? So there's a preceding word that comes from the mouth of God. And Mary was saying, I don't care about the kitchen right now. God is in the living room. He's right here in the flesh. I may never get this opportunity again. But let's just think, boy, I said I'm going to stretch a little bit, is that Martha wasn't just nervous about Mary not helping. Women were not supposed to be with men. And Jesus was teaching in the living room to other men too. And the women weren't allowed to be with the men. Was Jesus mad about this? Why not? Paradigm shift. <laughs> it's a new world now. It's a paradigm shift. Like, oh no, the women are not going to be considered as just property anymore. They have equal status. In fact, the first person who's going to see me coming out of the grave is an ex-prostitute that used to be full of seven demons. Not a very good resume. But Christian is all you need on your resume. Follower of Jesus. So now Martha's like, oh man, we're going to be in so much trouble after this meeting's over because they're going to say, Mary shouldn't have been sitting with the men. Now, look, you're laughing. I get it. But like we do this today. So that's all I'm asking you to do is just like, where am I doing that in my life where I'm too worried about the conventional way of thinking, but God is in the living room, man. Like this is an opportunity I may not get again. So I might have to change my way of doing things in the normal routine and be open to what he's doing. And that's, in a, in a nutshell, what the prophetic life is meant to be. Will you be right 100% of the time? Probably not. But the more you exercise those muscles, the better you get, you'll get at it, the more discerning you will be. Don't just say, well, if God wants it to happen, it'll just happen. He's sovereign. Sorry. That's such an excuse. He wants us to pray. 
if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and purpose to seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's all on us. Then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. So let's just finish it. The Lord answered her, Martha, you're right. What was I thinking? No, that's not what it says. Martha, my beloved Martha, why are you so upset and troubled, pulled away by all these many distractions? Are they really that important? Mary has discovered the one thing most important by choosing to sit at my feet. That's my altar verse for you today, okay? What's most important? Sit at the feet of Jesus. Hear what he's saying to you today. Don't have this mindset, he doesn't want to talk to me. I'm a nobody. That's not right. That's the devil telling you that. Let's stand, okay? Let's all recognize our citizenship in the kingdom. Thank you, Andrew. Somebody's excited. I'm a citizen of the kingdom. How about you? The passport is on your heart. Your green card is in your heart. The temple of God, the Holy Spirit lives inside your heart. Mary chose the better thing. Not wrong to serve. It's great to serve. But that can't become an idol of serving, right? You can't find your value and your identity in serving. Because God may change your serving. I did that when I was at another church. I was the head of the music ministry, and we were praying for more musicians. And God sent a better musician than me, which is not that hard, frankly. <laughs> That's why we were praying for more, right? So he sends one, and he says, okay, you can move on now. You don't have to do this anymore. And I'm like, yeah, but I want to. <laughs> I know, but I have something else I want you to do. Oh, but I really like this. Well, you know, Abraham went not knowing where he's going. You're going to like that too. And I did. I kept, I stayed in the band with him as the leader. That's really hard after you've been the one doing that. Like, you really have to humble yourself. Like, why'd you play that chord? Don't you know we do it this way? God say, nope, you're not in charge anymore. He's in charge, remember? <laughs> you prayed for him. <laughs> so don't take your identity in what you do because what you do is going to change, but who you are is not going to change. You're a son, a daughter of the living God. And the more time you spend at his feet, the more that's going to be real and aware to you. And I want that. I don't know about you, but I live for that. It's the most important thing. I didn't always believe that. I, I said I believed it, but my actions would have said no. And I repented to the Lord for that. So maybe we should do that. In any area of my heart where you haven't been first, Lord, I repent. Could you do that? Could you lift your hands? I'm not going to say it for you. You need to say it. Anywhere I haven't put you first, too busy in the kitchen when you were in the living room, I repent, Lord. He's a good father. He loves you. He's so happy you're realizing this. And prayerlessness is identified as a sin in the Bible. So this is biblical, what we're doing right now. I don't want any other gods before you. I want you first. I want to recognize the altar. It's moving because I'm moving, and you move with me, Lord. Help me not be so caught up in my activities and my false identities that I miss you when you're right in the house with me. I want to sit at your feet. I want to rebuild that personal altar. I give permission to the Holy Spirit to show me the direction that you want me to go. The picture of you, Lord, as an asylum seeker looking to be in my life, wow. Why you would love me so much, I have no idea. But I know you do. And I keep the door, come on, say this with me. I keep the door open of my heart. And you are invited in to have free reign in every part of my house. All right, so let's just pray in case somebody here has never asked the Lord to come in and don't have a personal relationship with the Lord. We're here to tell you that you can. Not only can you, it'll be the best decision, if you agree with me, react a little bit here. It'll be the best decision that you would ever make is to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life and have the temple of God living in your heart. Amen? Is that true, church? All right, so we'll just pray a prayer together. If you pray to invite him in, and today will be your birthday in the Lord. January 26, 2020, I got 2020 vision for God. Say it with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I don't want to be an asylum seeker anymore. 
I want to find my home in you. And I want you to find your home in me. I could not save myself, but I received the salvation that Jesus offers by taking my place on the cross, taking the punishment I deserved for the sins that I've committed. Thank you for substituting for me on that cross. You gave your life for me. I now give my life for you. I receive salvation and forgiveness. The resurrection power that you released into the earth when you conquered death and you sent your Holy Spirit. I receive your power in my life right now to be an obedient son or daughter now and for eternity. I receive you, Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just pray for a minute, okay, church? It's not just people in the room here. It could be people watching. A lot of times tears will come up because you'll just be so grateful that in spite of all your mistakes, God never said, no, sorry, Everybody else is okay, but you're too far away. You're too much of a sinner. We're here to tell you, no matter what your past is, you're not too far away from God. He will accept you in and has. If you said that prayer, he's already accepted you into his family. We have a prayer ministry team. Can they come up now, please? We do this at the end of every service. We have a prayer ministry team. And if you said that prayer today for the first time, we would like to invite you to come to what I've been talking about all day. This is an altar. And an altar is where you bring a sacrifice. And if today's the first day that you said a prayer of invitation to Jesus, your new family would love to know that, wouldn't we, church? Anybody here say that prayer today for the first time? Could you raise your hand if you did? Looks like we're all Christians. One, one in the back. Praise God. Praise God. Lord, we just pray for this new Christian. We thank you that the seed of the word of God is falling on good ground right now. The birds of the air can't have that seed. The cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches cannot have that seed. The hard ground cannot have that seed. We say her heart is good soil to receive your power to become an altar of the living God and the temple of your Holy Spirit in her. We welcome and celebrate with the angels today as another name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Well, if you feel so led, we would love to have you come up for prayer so we can explain it, give a Bible, and, and the rest of us can rejoice in knowing that our family grew today. Anybody else that needs prayer, that's what all these awesome people are up here. This is the highlight of their day to get to pray with you. And I mean that. I'm not kidding. If you can uh, just not leave here until you get that agreement of somebody to agree in prayer with you. Come on up right up this aisle. I bless you all to leave now. Go upstairs or fellowship or have to leave. Have an awesome time. We'll see you next week. Bless you.